We are here with the amazing Petra Bellini for the Italian wine course, your passport to Italy, for course number five on Tuscany. And without any further ado, let's move into the Solari wine room where Petra is waiting. And this is going to be a great class because this is the land of Petra and Chef Filippo. Let's go this way. Man. Today I, I really needed a lot of room. It was a little bit tough to be able to show you, not all, but most of the Toscan wines that we carry. Randy, what did we do? You bought up Toscany. Did I did. Know we love Tuscany because some of the best wines in the world come from Tuscany. Indeed. So since I won't be able during the live to get up and show you each single bottle, I just want to do a little bit of a visual for you so we go so i'm gonna have to step back and put on yeah. my wide angle lens possibly i'm just gonna highlight before i sit down uh sit down a couple of our favorite people we're gonna talk about some felice later with the wines we're tasting but definitely that definitely still from from san felice and ciao leonardo if you see this ciao francesca and ciao jenny um, but want to make sure that we, we were on the phone with him yesterday. So just so everybody knows, all of these wines you see here are on the Solari okay. wine list. So if you call us up for takeout or curbside, every one of these is available, including the Punitello. Look how cool that label is. That's an indigenous grape varietal recently discovered by Leonardo Bellaccini of San Felice. We have Luce, another cool label. So many. A great, great, great Brunello producer. This is um, Chef Filippo's favorite, the Tignello. Talk about some yeah. other ones here. Okay, yes, so we, as you can see, got a lot of cool stuff to choose from. Uh, in the meantime, while Randy set up the phone, um, making sure that you have the two wines ready for today. If they're open already, great, because um, as we already said, all Italian wines benefits from some oxygen. So you want to have open your Chianti Classico San Felice 2017 and the Hebo from Petra uh, 2017, okay? So make sure you have them nice and ready to go and welcome home with me. Thank you. So today, as Wendy said, we are in Tuscany, okay? And uh, somebody's going to have to stop me from talking because uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, this is where I was born and raised, as Randy said, as well as Filippo. I moved here when I, uh, well, 2007, so now I feel like I have another beautiful home in San Diego. Uh, but needless to, needless to say that there's no one day that goes by that I don't dream about being in my beautiful region. And I'm gonna be a little bit biased, I can't help it. Uh, maybe I'm gonna make some other Italian listening to this angry because they come from different regions. But guys, Toscany is Toscany. It's, it's just that simple. It's, it's tough to beat. We have a lot of other beautiful places uh, in Italy. Of course, Toscany doesn't need a lot of uh, introductions. Uh, it's fairly famous. Who, doesn't, who hasn't heard about Firenze? Who hasn't heard about Lucca uh, and uh, Toscan food and all of that? I know it's, it's, it's in your head already, right? Well, maybe when we're going to talk about the region of Marche, there's going to be a lot of things that you never heard before. So. Without further ado, let's get into, talk about Toscany a little bit, mostly, again, as we do every time, from a wine point of view. Uh, so Toscany, um, as many of you probably know or guessed, uh, is together with uh, Piemonte and Veneto, top three uh, winemaking uh, region of Italy. Most of the uh, most famous Italian uh, wines come actually from Toscany. Uh, making some example, we'll talk more about Brunello di Montalcino, of course, Chianti, uh, Vernaccia di San Gimignano, and then some of the most famous uh, uh, Bordeaux blend, Sassicaia, Tignanello, Vigorello, uh, Guado al Tasso, you name it. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on again. Uh, but definitely, um, Toscany is one of, uh, um, I'd say it's super important in terms of uh, great quality wines coming from Italy. Um, today, what I wanted to do, with, with, after giving you a little bit of general information about the region, I decided to have a focus, otherwise I could talk about uh, my region for hours. And the focus is to talk to you a little bit about the difference between what's considered to be the ancient Tuscany, so the heart of Tuscany, where the oldest appellation come from, 
Chianti, for example, or Vino Nobile or Carmignano DOCG, and then talk about the new Tuscany, which is um, mostly the coastal area going to the south. Kind of think about the region divided in two, like from the central area going um, northeast, you have more of the new Tuscany a little bit to the south, too, so center to the to the east, and then center to the west. That's where you have um, uh, the newer appellations and the more modern ones, okay? Where they use also international varieties. Um, so Tuscany is definitely a region where most production is red wine. So uh, it's about 80 to 20, uh, to give you an idea. Uh, so when we talk about the most famous white wine of uh, uh, Tuscany, the Vernaccia di San Gimignano, there's a reason why it's called the white in the land of reds, okay? If somebody of you saw the very first, uh, one of the very first live we did, we actually talked in deep about Vernaccia di San Gimignano and one of our favorite producers was Montenidoli and Elisabetta Fagioli. Uh, so definitely a lot of love for her and for her winery. We mentioned her many, many times. And um, so it is Vernaccia di San Gimignano, the most important white wine made in Tuscany and the only white wine that has the highest appellation, which is the OCG, and we discussed that already, right? Uh, but beside that, and then production of Vermentino and Trebbiano Toscano, and of course, uh, uh, Moscato uh, for the production of dessert wines, uh, but the most important uh, and the most famous wines from Tuscany would be reds. Uh, and the most important variety in Tuscany is, I know you know this, I don't know who says Sangiovese, but somebody did, and good, bravo, exactly. Sangiovese is uh, among the most planted uh, varieties all over Italy, but it's definitely the red grape of uh, Tuscany, uh, and along with Montepulciano of the central area of, uh, uh, of Italy. And Sangiovese is uh, pretty much present in most of the appellations uh, of red wines that we make in Tuscany, uh, in certain areas more than others, uh, but definitely it is the key variety of the region and the wines that we're going to try today the both one yes oh is this because hey, in case you're wondering if people yeah. are watching several people jumped in right away including lisa and beyond clever with san Gervais, so ciao guys in case you wondering, as soon as you asked they came in with answers so. very proud of Pete, you both your class is watching <laughs> grazie for following at, uh, with attention um uh, okay so going back to our toscany i talk about this imaginary uh, division um, I was having a very interesting discussion actually with my co-worker uh, Tommy, uh, with whom I'm having a lot of fun recently training ourselves more and more on Italian wines. And uh, you know, gotta do something when you're locked at home, right? Um, so um, in a, a, this distinction that I'm making between old, and, uh, and ancient and new Tuscany, please take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, uh, how old the uh, appellation is. For example, opening and closing a parenthesis, Brunello di Montalcino, which is considered to be one of the ancient Tuscany appellation, it is a fairly new wine in terms of the appellation itself for Tuscany, if compared, for example, to Chianti, or if compared to Carmignano, or even Vino Nobile. Uh, that being said, I think the distinction helps to understand uh, where the focus is in terms of the variety and also wine making, uh, wine making techniques. Uh, so while in, the, in what's considered to be more the heart of Tuscany, the ancient area, there's of course uh, mostly, uh, all, most of the, all the wines are focused on Sangiovese, in the part that you, we call the new Tuscany, not necessarily. Sangiovese, again, is present, uh, but there is a lot of international varieties, both Bordeaux or Rhone varieties. So you find Cabernet Sauvignon, you find Merlot, you find Cab Franc, uh, but you also find Syrah, uh, Mouvedre, uh, you name it. So both, uh, both, kind, uh, both varieties, um, Bordeaux and Rhone, are very represented mostly in the... You probably can't see the map, so I'm pointing for myself but mostly again on the coastal area of uh, Tuscany. Now, um, so old area, we said from Chianti in the middle, going to the east, and the new, new area is on the coastal area with, I would say the art of it would be Bolgheri, where we do our Bolgheri DOC, 
which are mostly based on uh, Bordeaux varietals, Merlot, Cabernet, Cab Franc mostly. You find production of Syrah and other varieties there. Very few planted Sangiovese in that area. Actually, Sangiovese definitely doesn't thrive over there, just so you know. It's, it's, it's not the kind of soil and the kind of microclimate that Sangiovese likes. Therefore, you find very few that are using Sangiovese in the blend uh, in the area of Bulgari. That changes a little bit when you start to go in the southern part of Tuscany, which is still considered part of the new Tuscany, but there you start to find appellations such as uh, Montecucco uh, Sangiovese or Morellino di Scansano, which are also Sangiovese based, uh, but uh, a little bit newer uh, in, the, in the making, okay? Uh, as per, uh, so we talked about both, uh, now let's talk about the most important wines that are in each category. So for the older uh, part of Toscany, Chianti, Vino Nobile, Carmignano, Brunello di Montalcino, uh, and uh, I think I covered them all. And then for the newer part, you would have the Bulgari Doc, you will have the Maremma Doc, uh, you would have a lot of IGTs, uh, just uh, labeled as IGTs, Indicazione Geografica Tipica. Remember, there was almost uh, pretty much an appellation that was created to actually have an appellation for wines that couldn't fit in any other, um, other appellation that was already existing. Um, it's important to say that that's exactly how the IGT and the Super Toscans were born, which this is something important for you to know. So the main area of production of these blends and the IGTs and what we call Super Toscans would be Bulgari, the coastal area and going south, but that's not where they were, where they were born. As a matter of fact, the first Super Toscans were born in the heart of Chianti Classico from producers uh, whose goal was to produce a great wine. And they felt that the rules of the appellation in the moment of Chianti, referring to that, were a little bit tight on them. Uh, for example, back then, uh, late 60s, early 70s, which is when we see the first vintage of uh, Sassicaia and uh, Vigorello, for example, and Tignanello, uh, back then, uh, the Chianti regulation allowed for the use of white varieties, actually demand for it. Uh, and uh, some of these producers, from Antinori uh, to uh, San Felice to uh, um, Pier Inciso della Rocchetta for Sassicaia, they all thought that no, this, this is not the quality that we want to make. We want to do something different. But, but, but uh, the appellation doesn't allow us. So what do we do? And they say, you know what? We just don't care. We make a great wine and we label it as table wine. So Tignanello, which I have the bottle here, was most likely one of the most expensive table wine, vino da tavola, ever produced. Uh, years later, in the 90s, again, the, the IGT um, uh, appellation was created, and now, and now most of these wines actually are, um, if, they're, if they're not IGT, they're DOC. Uh, with uh, uh, a little bit of a curiosity for Sassicaia, uh, Sassicaia, which is pos it's considered to be the, the father of Super Toscans, uh, even if maybe not necessarily the first one bottled. Uh, but Sassicaia is the one and only wine in Italy that has a proprietary dock. So I wasn't able to find the bottle handy around, so I just had the case out for that. But if you look at the label of Sassicaia, it actually say Sassicaia, Bulgari Dock Sassicaia. It, ha it has the name Sassicaia in the name of the dock. And that's a one case only, but it shows you how important, for example, this wine um, is considered. Now, um, just so you know, I can see the comments, so if you're asking questions or anything like that, I'm not able to see it, okay? Um, so, Super Toscans, Old Toscany, um, kind of mention all of that. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna get up one second to see what time it is. Give me one moment to see if I should start tasting the wines. We start a little bit later, so I might have a little bit more time. Let's talk a second about something else that is very important for Tuscany. First of all, uh, the, in terms of uh, landscape, I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, the beautiful, romantic, uh, rolling hills of uh, Tuscany with the Cypresses Road. Uh, it's hard to beat. I mean, some of the places where you, where you can drive by, uh, they're, they're breathtaking. And, and I'm not just saying this because I'm from there. 
Uh, it, it's just, uh, I remember when we were in Tuscany um, last year with our tour, because Solari actually brings people uh, touring in Tuscany. Let us know if you want more information about that. And we were supposed to be there, but we had to cancel it clearly for this year. Uh, but there's uh, the area of uh, the Val d'Orcia, for example, you stand and you look at the landscape there, it, it looks like it's off a painting. It, it looks unreal. Uh, that's how beautiful it is. Uh, and I wish I could show you some pictures that we took during our last tour. Um, don't have the availability now, but uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and in fact, it's uh, one of the reasons why I decided this theme today, meaning to focus a little bit on the difference between new and old Tuscany, it's because that's kind of how we uh, created our tour. So when we take our friends to Tuscany, we actually start in what's considered to be the new Tuscany, and we are in a beautiful place in Bulgari. We visit the most important wineries there, and then we make our way up to Montalcino. Uh, so we, 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 we're driving uh, through the middle, and then we finish with Chianti, and then we go home. Uh, so it's, it's, it's actually the, the theme of the, the tour and the two ones that we're trying today, keep that in mind, are both from wineries that we visit during the tour. So we go to um, Petra, which is in Suvereto, a little bit inland. So not, it's not Bulgari, but it's still a big area of production for uh, IGT, Super Toscans. There's actually a new DOCG, which is the Suvereto DOCG, and Petra also makes those. Uh, but this one would be the IGT, okay? So this is their uh, everyday uh, lighter wine. Then they make a beautiful Merlot 100%, a big Cabernet, and those would be the, the ones that are labeled as uh, DOCG Suvereto. And then we're gonna go to Chianti. So the San Felice, which is located in uh, um, Berardenga, I for, I'm spacing out the first name, Serra Nuova Berardenga, CPM, yes. CPM. That's where they're located. They, they actually own the Poggio, which is called San, San Felice. They did a beautiful job by restoring it. They have hospitality. And our friend Leonardo will be very happy to, to see you all going there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, without further ado, I think we should start talking about the wines in specific and taste them. And then at the end, I'm gonna add something about the beautiful cuisine of Tuscany. And I think Filippo might bring something fun for us to look and for me to eat. Sorry, I won't be able to share that. Okay, so um, the wines today. We're gonna start, um, doesn't really matter in terms of body, those two wines are comparable. So why don't we start from tradition and then we move to the new Tuscany. So let's start with the Chianti Classico San Felice 2017. Uh, one word about the vintage, which actually applies to both, which is perfect. Uh, 2017 was a very, very hot and dry year. Wines are great. Not, the problem wasn't the quality at the end, because winemakers knew what they were doing. The problem was that, in most cases, they lost a lot of um, yield, um, from 25 to, in some cases, 50% of production. Uh, so what you're getting from 2017, there are in most cases, very nice wine. Of course, you're gonna feel that they come from a hotter vintage, so a little bit bolder and fruit forward uh, with maybe less notes of uh, vibrant strawberries or fresh cherries. Maybe you're gonna find more prune or, or, dark, or dark, uh, darker fruit, uh, maybe less of the herbal notes that you normally get from Sangiovese, like tobacco leather is gonna be a little bit less there. Uh, but they're still outstanding. Same thing for the, um, the, the Hebo that we're gonna have right after, so same vintage. So keep that in mind, 17 uh, has this peculiarity. Now, in terms of how the wine is made, this is 80% uh, Sangiovese, and then there's a 10% of uh, Colorino, and a 10% of Cannaiolo. Colorino and Cannaiolo are very important uh, native variety of Tuscany, and they, uh, they were both uh, always using the blending of Toscany. Sorry, uh, did I say, I made a mistake. I think there's 10% Pugnitello, Colorino and Pugnitello uh, in this wine, not, not Canaiolo. And uh, Pugnitello, let's open the parentheses. I showed you the bottle earlier. I think you can see it here. So this was, is a native variety of Toscany that was almost completely disappeared, but San Felice found some in their vineyards and then together with the University of Study of Florence, uh, they pretty much brought it back to life, replanted it. And now Pugnitello not only is part of the blending on their Chianti, but they also make a 100% varietal Pugnitello, which is just amazing. So if you wanna 
If you're like, you love Toscan wines, but you want to try something different, that it's not uh, Sangiovese, you should definitely give Pugnitello a try. We never ran out. Every time we're down to one, two bottles, let's get another six pack because we really, really appreciate it. So thank you, Leonardo and San Felice for the awesome job that you did with Pugnitello. Uh, the Chianti Classico, uh, San Felice does uh, 12 months in uh, large casks. So when you approach this wine, you should not expect to find an oak bomb at all. Uh, it should be very fresh and very uh, light, medium, medium, medium body. Uh, doesn't have too much oak. Color, it's still 2017, we talked about a um, hotter vintage, so it's quite concentrated. To be a Sangiovese has a nice, robust uh, color. Cherry, raspberry, the violets, the sweet violets typical of Sangiovese. I don't know if you guys agree and if you can smell them. Great acidity, great food wine. Think about this from something as simple as a pizza, make sure there's some tomato on it, to a plate of pasta with either tomato sauce or some meat. Think about enjoying this with a nice uh, platter of charcuterie and um, cheeses. I mean, it's so versatile. A wine that, it's an everyday drinking wine, but a, pl a very pleasant one. I don't know if you guys agree, I'm not sure if you're commenting on it, but. I personally, personally love their Chianti. They also make a Riserva, Il Grigio, they make a Gran Selezione, which is a new, um, a new uh, appellation in the world of Chianti, very, very recent. And, uh, and then they make, of course, in, in other areas, San Felice also makes um, Brunello. Uh, they are located in the southern west part of Montalcino and they make a Brunello called uh, Campo Giovanni and a, a Riserva that's called Il Quercione both amazing, amazing Brunellos. Also, I recommend you to try. The 2015 is about to make it on the market. So we just had the pleasure to sample it with Leonardo the other day, and it's just delicious. Uh, moving forward to the Petra, unless there's some questions about Chianti. There was this one person, Susie, that says, sign me up for the next Tuscany tour. So maybe at the end, don't take your time away from the class now, but maybe talk a little bit about that toward the end. Of course. Uh, yes, Susie, I will let, uh, give you more information. Then, of course, you can always email us and we can give you more details uh, privately. Uh, so, uh, remember when you talk about Chianti Classico, it's going to be the one where you find the black rooster on uh, the little thingy. So, just if it is Chianti Classico, we'll have this little symbol here. Because the Chianti region is huge and Chianti Classico is just... Uh, the most historical and ancient area of production for Chianti. That's actually what Classico means in many, many Italian labels. So you have Chianti Classico, you have Soave Classico, Amarone and Valpolicella Classico, and so be it. So when you see the word Classico, it refers to the fact that this, the, all the grapes are sourced from the most historical area of production of that specific wine, okay? Moving to Suvereto. So we take our car, we go back toward the ocean, to the, to, the, to the west, and we make it to Suvereto, which, by the way, it's a very, very pretty hamlet with a lot of history. Um, it's about, I'd say, half an hour driving from Bulgari, so still there. And in this case, uh, the one that you're having is a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Sangiovese. Also, this one doesn't do a lot of oak, and the oak that it does is fairly neutral, big, big casks, so don't expect to find, uh, it's gonna be a very lean and uh, um, uh, refreshing uh, wine. Uh, let's look at that. You'll see that if you compare them next to each other, you understand a little bit what I say when I talk about the color of Sangiovese. It's clear that this one, it's made with other things. Remember, it's also the same vintage, but you all see, right, that the Hebo is quite darker. Please, Filippo, come in. I got mine in. I'll take a break one second from the wine. So just so you know, look at this. This is the Tonno del Chianti. Can you guys see it? Here, maybe bring it just a little bit closer, a little bit closer, right there is perfect. Maybe a little bit higher, because this is so good, I want everybody to see it. So just so you know, we are bean eaters in Tuscany, a lot of beans. You give me a bean, I'll make something out of it. From cannellini to garbanzo beans, lentils, uh, all of it. And uh, so this dish is Sovana 
cannellini, which is a specific breed of cannellini beans, a little bit smaller. They come from the southern part of Tuscany. And I'll take a second to say, hi Carla, those comes from your neck of the wood. This dish with her chili e giolo, talking about other native varieties of Tuscany, would be just delicious. And then the meat on top is um, pork that uh, we actually, um, is, is the right word ferment? No. Uh, cure. Not, no. Help me. It's almost like you're preserving, yeah, like, preserve. like you'd preserve tomatoes in a can. Got it. So that, that, and this is a process that our ancestors did when there was no refrigeration. So what happens when a, a beautiful, healthy little pig uh, somehow dies and I have all that meat that I can feed my family with for months, how do I preserve that meat? So what they would do is put it under uh, a combination of white wine and olive oil and salt and then pretty much uh, store it as you would store today uh, canned tuna if you want. Therefore, the name, I'm going to show it to you again, Tonno del Chianti, which means tuna from the Chianti region, because if you look at that, it looks like shredded tuna from a can, but it's not, it's pork. And as my father would say, the perfect meat that needs nothing added to it, just eat it as it is. So going back to our Hebo, sorry for the interruption and I can't wait to enjoy that. It's gonna be hard keep talking to you about wine with the dish next to me, but I'll do my best. So blend of Cabernet Merlot and Sangiovese, color, I hope you were able to notice the difference and make sure that the, the, the depth of the color comes from the, uh, the use, of course, of Cabernet Merlot, which are much darker grapes by nature. Um, this one, definitely you're gonna find, if you ask me even before I try it, if you compare with the sip of the Chianti you just have, here you're gonna find lower acidity and most likely the tanning structure should be a little bit silkier. Why? Because you got Merlot in there. And that's kind of what Merlot brings uh, to the game. Well, well Cabernet is gonna bring a more structure and more uh, fruit, of course, to a Sangiovese based wine. The Merlot is what's gonna help us move down the overall acidity and the tanning structure. So let's try it. Very pretty, I hope you agree. Very earthy, um, minerally. Completely different kind of soil when you go to Subereto. You go from flat land like on sea level, you start to go a little bit higher in terms of altitude. Current, blackberry, cherry here too. A little bit of green notes. Hmm. What else do you guys uh, taste? But most importantly, do you like it? Are you enjoying the wine that that shared the name with me. And by the way, look how beautiful the winery is. If you look at your labels, that picture in front is what you see when you get from the front gate and you get to Petra. And again, we got the pleasure to bring people there. It's just uh, amazing. It's a famous architectural um, development made by a famous architect, I believe his name is Botta, uh, that built this winery and it's all done by gravity. So when you look at your label, uh, the grapes go all on top of the staircase and then they go down where the winery is, is on the floor, on the bottom level. Just very, very nice place. Now, I'm going to take two seconds since Susie asked to uh, kind of uh, finish the class by telling you more about our tour to Tuscany. It's a five night, six days tour. We meet in Florence, of course, and then we get on a bus, uh, which is all ours, and we start driving to the coastal area. We go in Bulgari, where we spend two nights, and we visit places such as Ornellaia, Sassicaia. Uh, this year we were gonna go to Guado Almelo and others. Uh, we, do, we have amazing, pretty much we drink and eat, just so you know. So if you're not, if you don't like drinking and eating too much, maybe this is not your kind of tour, but that's what we do all day long and if we don't get tired of it for, in, for six days. After that, we go to Montalcino, where we stay in a beautiful place in uh, San Quirico d'Orcia, right in the middle of Val d'Orcia, the, the beautiful place with beautiful landscapes I was still talking to you about. And there we focus on Brunello di Montalcino. We also go and take a, an amazing and fun cooking class in a farm where they produce uh, Pecorino di Pienza, which is a product protected from the European Union that it's made just in that area, around the Pienza, other very famous hamlet of that area. 
and uh, and then we uh, we stay there three days and then we hit the road back and going toward Florence we stop at San Felice to see Leonardo and then we're having the last amazing lunch at uh, in Panzano at Dario Cecchini which is a very famous guy who has a butcher shop in Panzano and is very famous as the king of the steak in, in Tuscany. Uh, and there's an episode with him on Netflix, you can search it and have some fun looking at the history and the tradition behind the Bistecca alla Fiorentina, which is another very important item that we make in Tuscany, along with uh, many bread soups, pappa al pomodoro, ribollita, um, what else, fegatini, uh, which are uh, bruschetta, crostini, made with chicken liver pate, very typical. Uh, truffles, black truffles for Tuscany, definitely we're not famous for white, uh, but black truffle, a lot of them. Um, I mean, I can go on and on. And then beans, as I said. And then castagnaccio, which chestnut flour-based dessert with pine nuts. Mm, yummy. Or cantucci, you know, what you guys call biscotti, the one with the almonds in it. You get some of those and you just dip them into bean santo to get them a little softer and then you eat them. Pleasure for the palate. So, uh, yeah, it, I hope it show how much I love my <laughs> land of origin. Uh, if I didn't, I, I failed miserably and um, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you're liking the, these wines uh, and I, if you have more questions again, don't ever hesitate contacting us, we'll be here for you and almost forgot to tell you what we're doing on Thursday. Talking about less known regions, can you guys see? Uh, you're perfect. So we're staying in the center of Italy, but we're going to Marche and Abruzzo, right on the east coast. Beautiful beaches there too. And then we're going to talk a little bit about one of the few landlocked regions of Italy, which is Umbria. Okay? We're going to taste wines uh, just from Marche actually uh, tomorrow, but we're going to cover a little bit all the regions. That being said, I'm going to let you go to enjoy the rest of your Tuesday afternoon. I'm going to cheer with the hebo, which is what I have in my hands. And I hope to see you all on Thursday. <laughs>